When I first considered this topology, the lines between levels of blame attribution seemed really easy to draw between crises that organizations could be held accountable for, might be held accountable for, and could not be held accountable for. However, as crisis research has developed, it's become clear that these lines are subjective. And so hopefully this topology demonstrates that crises can best be classified on a continuum of blame attribution from situations where full blame attribution for the primary crisis can be placed squarely at the organization's door to situations where no blame for the primary crisis can reasonably be attributed to the organization. So as we move from the debatable domain of the events and even reputational crises into disasters, it should be clear that no reasonable blame attribution could be made in an organization based on the emergence of a disaster. However, disasters also carry risk for organizations depending on how they respond. Thus, aside from the direct material problems created by the disaster, much of the crisis risk associated with disasters is connected to the secondary crises stemming from the organization's response to the disaster. Moreover, because disasters are likely to be severe, both in terms of material impact and perceived severity, they also carry a lot of risk for organizations and stakeholders. Before we talk about disasters from a risk and crisis context, let's all think about the different ways that we can think about disasters, the number of people affected by them, and the, how they affect people around the world. I think 2020 has made it really clear that we're all susceptible to disasters, but this has been the case for a long time, but we may not have all seen it the same way. Aside from blame attribution, what makes disasters different from other types of crises is the degree to which both organization and stakeholder alike can be similarly affected by the events that are completely outside their locus of control. However, just because organizations can't control the weather doesn't mean that people and organizations can't be prepared for them, and that's really how organizations are judged in the wake of disasters. As a crisis type, interest in disasters has grown considerably amongst crisis communication researchers since Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans in August 2005 demonstrated that both a lack of hurricane preparation and poor response by different governmental agencies cost lives and money. However, since the 2011 Fukushima disaster and the 2015 Ebola crisis, Researchers and practitioners have really focused on the intersection of disaster management and crisis communication, with a lot of research focusing not just only on traditional mechanisms for response, but realizing that social media is a vital way of not only communicating with publics, but also getting live updates about what's happening during disasters. 2020 is likewise spurring a significant amount of research interest with special editions of journals on COVID being offered as a way to share the latest information and research for organizations to help address and cope with the problems emerging because of the pandemic. Disasters also pose unique challenges from a crisis communication context because so many of them are global and demand serious reconsideration of policy and approach in their wake. For example, after the Fukushima disaster, governments across Europe, including Switzerland, Austria, and Germany, have reflected on nuclear energy and reconsidered the risks to the environment and their populations, deciding to phase out nuclear energy programs in favor of other alternative energy sources. However, countries like the UK and France continue to develop their nuclear energy programs, so debates about disasters and disaster response are complex and challenging in their aftermath. However, the immediate crisis response is also complex as well because of the fear-based responses that disasters invoke. We'll be talking more about stakeholder emotion later in the, the podcast series, but strong emotional responses make crisis communication even more challenging. One of the unique challenges for disasters or other similar types of crises is how to accommodate the mourning process for families of those whose lives have been lost or dramatically affected by the events. These are especially difficult when crises occur outside of the victim's own country or when, like the 2020 pandemic, they affect how we can either gather to mourn. When we're talking about crises that invoke fear, we also have to talk about terrorist attacks and external violence in the context of disasters. 
This is one of the most understudied types of crises in the field, yet this is an arena where crisis communication can probably offer some of the most direct benefits. Of course, issues of social violence and terror attacks remain on people's minds these days because of the litany of attacks from many different groups in many different countries. However, the Charlie Hebdo attacks were communicatively particularly interesting for a host of reasons. Hebdo as an organization was obviously targeted because of its politics, but it offers a profound example of how events outside the organization's control can affect people's identities, attitudes, and even behaviors. In response to the crisis, Hebdo maintained that it was going to be undeterred by the events, that it was going to remain controversial. However, emerging around the attacks and responses to it, there seemed to be a public sentiment shift beyond Europe and, and beyond in both pro and potentially anti-social ways. In pro-social contexts, we saw evidence of public sentiment of solidarity and people organizing themselves online to try and offer safe houses in the wake of violence that re-emerged in Belgium and in the UK in subsequent attacks. However, in more challenging social contexts, we've also seen a resurgence of anti-immigration and nationalist movements, organizations ranging from local and multinational businesses through government and non-governmental organizations are then left not only trying to plan for these eventualities, but also how to manage communication and public sentiment connected to those affecting from everything from their public relations to their employment practices. The purpose of identifying crises and classifying them is to provide a straightforward way to understand the implications posed by different types of crises based on the reasonable blame that can be both materially and arguably attributed to the organization, and then consider the potential for material or perceived severity from a stakeholder perspective. That's as a way to predict the risk posed to an organization by different types of crisis. So, We've established that we can understand different types of crises based on this continuum of blame attribution from those crises that have virtually no attributable blame at the point that the crisis is triggered to those where blame is clearly attributable to the organization at the point of trigger. Now what happens after the crisis triggered is entirely something different. As we discussed in the transgression podcast, when the event is triggered, that's the primary crisis. However, in many cases, the secondary crisis that emerges may be even more problematic for the organization, like our example of Hurricane Katrina in the U.S., or the 2010 Haitian earthquake, where the government response to the disaster actually worsened the effects of the disaster. You can compare that to China's 2008 response to the Sichuan earthquake, where that their response not only helped to save lives, but also improved the trust in government. The fact of the matter is that no matter the type of crisis, we can use this classification topology to classify any crisis based on the blame and the severity of the crisis to not only predict stakeholder emotion and involvement, but also, as we'll discuss in later podcasts, to predict the type of crisis responses necessary to manage the situation, stakeholder expectations, and an organization's relationships with its stakeholders.